So thanks, thanks for coming out. It's it's really cool. I see some faces who I don't recognize. So um, thanks for taking a, a chance and coming out tonight. Um, all right. So I have this particular mug that was given to me by my aunt. Apparently, the colors and patterns in the mug arrive from a, arise from a process of firing and refiring, which in the case of this mug took place 84 times. Clearly excessive. I find this fascinating because it seems unlikely that one could have a clear sense of what has gotten better or worse for the vast majority of firings, save for the first couple or the last few. How important is it for the artist to be able to say that after firing number 84, the mug was unequivocally better than it was after any and all of the preceding attempts. Actually, I think it is neither particularly important nor preferable, since as an artist, one works by creating and responding to trends and not by analyzing computations or exact values. This is important because in the process of doing something over and over, and in this case, 84 times, one can gain a sense of ownership over tendencies which come from the materials and the processes themselves. What a potter who fires a mug 84 times is looking for, I believe, and what I've been looking for as well in my No End in Sight series, are encounters with certain qualities, size, color, texture, shape, place, that over time enable a personal sense of fluency in a language native to the materials. It's like speaking versus dreaming in a foreign language. One is about skill, the other is about intuition. The artist's voice presents itself in connections drawn angularly across daily patterns. Chance brings everything together, colliding everything into everything. The role of identity is to map out these collisions, pull them into figuration, and when necessary, to create narratives or distances that push all that is hurtling towards each other apart. What does an egg have to do with a pine cone? What is the distance between a rock and a foam rubber orange? What does it mean that a thin plastic straw might fit exactly into the hole of a hair curler? These unreasonable collisions draw a pattern. I think of a bull charging at a red cape. It does not matter that bulls are colorblind because the people in the audience above are sensitive to color and its associations. The juggernaut rushes forth with dis the ru juggernaut rushes forward with destructive force. The bull and the cape are in one arena. The audience and the cape's color are above it. The bullfighter's operations below create a narrative above that dramatizes an impossible collision between the bull's mind and their own, and draws people's attention away from all the bulls not encircled, charging powerfully with no particular point. The fog of meaningless collisions drumming the walls of the arena are somewhat silenced, somewhat embodied, somewhat honored by the image of a single engagement in which one force relentlessly attempts to make contact with another. A final point I want to make is that there is a very, diff very important dynamic involved here between the rationality of perceiving patterns and the irrationality of choosing when and why a pattern must begin or end. I think sometimes we attach ourselves so fully to completion as a goal that we fail to consider lack of completion as a tool or a method. Part of my process in No End in Sight, and these small pieces are part of the No End in Sight series, part of my process in No End in Sight was taking objects that were clearly complete and proceeding as if they were not. Much more of my effort went into removing completion rather than reinstating it because once a material had truly been reopened, had truly re-emerged into the field of relentless collisions, the process of completion was often instantaneous. What does the number 84 mark? 84 marks the introduction of both completion and the lack of completion. 84 is the length of the chaos, the dimension of the meaning. So um, that was, uh, was a, from a, uh, a show I did in Korea called The Moment of Transposition. Um, and I wanted to share that because I think it sets up a lot of um, things that I'm going to talk about throughout this lecture. Um, I was spe speaking specifically about this series called No Insight. Um, I did it, I, I made these sculptures, um, I think between 2006 and 2000, and 
nine. Oftentimes I spend a lot of time in series and work in, in a kind of repetitive fashion. Um, so the dates are kind of squirrely. Um, but I, um, I had been doing this, these really short writings at the time, sort of inf influenced by Barth's mythologies. And, and there were, I was making similarly bite-sized sculptures. Um, I, I set up a basic rule system, which was um, each one of these sculptures is about palm-sized. Um, and each one is the, the um, sort of output of one sitting. So the, the idea was I would go into the studio. I, I had a studio in Queens. And you know I think during the week, I would collect materials, and I'd bring things back. And then it became a kind of improvisational thing. Um, and my studio was like 150 square feet. It was tiny. And, um, so uh, each, each one of these sculptures is its separate answer. Like um, the piece on the top left, I think I'd found this metal wiffle ball, metal golf wiffle ball. And um, so I, I submerged it in a block of plaster and I threw it against the wall until it found a form. Um, the piece on the bottom left is a piece of automotive shrink tubing that I, I punctured with a needle and then boiled in hot water so that the shrink tubing pulled in while the, um, oh, automotive shrink tubing over a piece of hot glue and the hot glue kind of pulled out while the shrink tubing pushed in. Um, other pieces, you know, were fed to dogs, literally, like, fried and um, burned. Um, yeah, I, I think this period was really a period of material exploration, just really trying to figure out um, what was out there, I guess. Um, so, you know, like, I consider myself a bricolore, um, and I think I'm a bricolore in the sort of tradition of Levi-Strauss. And um, like Levi-Strauss talks about the bricolore as, he talks about it in relationship to the engineer and the bricolore, like bricolé, I don't know if he coined the term, but bricolé, it, it means to swerve in it. And it's, a, it's within the language of games. So like a bricolore um, is perhaps someone like you're mo moving forward and then you kind of swerve and, and create an, a new move or, or a new uh, pathway. Um, and part of the importance of the bricolore is that you use what's around you to create meaning. So, like, uh, Levi Strauss talks about the engineer as being uh, perhaps someone who, who starts from, like, a, a zero position. But the bricolore is always starting with history, within and um, um, amongst uh, the, the life of history. Um, so I wanted to read this quote. Um, the real question is not whether the... Oh, he's talking about magic um, and sort of, like, I, mean, I don't know if he's talking, I think, to some extent he's talking about magic and, and he's, um, he's, he's talking uh, about the connections that are being made between um, woodpecker's beaks and, and some kind of palliative capacity. So he says, the real question is not whether the touch of a woodpecker's beak does in fact cure toothache. It is rather whether there is a point of view from which a woodpecker's beak and a man's tooth can be seen as going together. The use of this congruity for therapeutic purposes being only one of its possible uses and whether some initial order can be introduced by means of these groupings. So um, one phrase that has been sort of recurring to me a lot um, is that relationship is a fundamental characteristic of form. And I think that's something that really plays out in all of my work. Um, sort of the idea of, a, I think it's like objects aren't contained in and of themselves. They're always, uh, the form always comes out in the relationships of things, of forces, of time periods, of um, materials, um, but that form only exists at, at these relational points, not in some like kind of like er, like protean ooze or something that but that it, it's like in these points of contact. Um, yeah, and so like I, even though it seems pretty simple, I think this idea of like what goes together and what is separate uh, is something that I, I find really kind of fascinating and, and um, I continue to find it fascinating. Um, so this is a piece that is really important to me. Um, it's called The History of Equivalentistics. Um, this was its an initial, um, this is like an installation and then this is from a show in Korea in 2011. Um, but the basic 
the basic idea is, um, I think I was really bothered, you know, I didn't, I came to art sort of like round, in a roundabout way and so like I really didn't understand a lot of things, things didn't make sense to me, I didn't like that you could have a, like you could have a set of 10 photographs and everyone could disagree about which was the best one. Like I wanted some consensus, I wanted something um, that lasted, some, some, something, something built in. Um, and, and of course that's like the tension that moves through the work all the time. But um, So sort of out of that desire, um, I did this performance where, um, you know, I was interested in this idea of the picturesque and uh, this was um, at the top of Mount Demosan in Seoul and it was like a designated tourist photo opportunity spot. Um, so it was kind of like this um, sort of like easier, it, it was like a sublime moment that was ready for you to just insert yourself into. Um, so what I did was I, I went there at the same time of day for months, I wore the same thing, I sat in the same spot and um, I gave people my camera actually like a point and shoot camera and had them take a random photo of their choosing and I did it until um, I found two photos that were equivalent. Um, I did the same thing um, at this place called Changdeokgung Palace. Um, and I think like in this scenario it took like 358 photos and the other one was like 600 something photos. Um, but I was really interested in both of these sites because they, they, and both of them lacked time in a way. Like there was the kind of um, eternal time of nature and this, again, this like picturesque setting. Um, and then the kind of stunted time of, of this weird tourist ceremony place where um, like, so this is like a, a, a tourist changing of the guard ceremony. So every day at, from like three to four o'clock, a different actor, set of actors would come up and, and sort of perform this ritual history. Um, and it, I, I kind of saw that as a, a, an experimental condition that I could insert myself into. Um, I, the thing that I've, I found really interesting about this piece was one, or th what continues to matter to me about this piece is one that um, the beginning and the ending were, were like included um, from the from the initial premise of like um, oh I should step backwards so like um, what I liked about these was um, you know like it, in in the set of 368 photos um, that comprise this full experience like a lot of them are much better than these photos they're much more satisfying they're indicative of a, of a real experience but um, I thought these two were the most unique by being the least unique. They, they were tied to each other and I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, I also liked that the process included its own beginning and ending bec because I didn't really know when these pairs would meet or, or even if that, that were possible. And I started to get scared in the mountain one that it wasn't going to happen. Um, I think something that I was um, really interested in the time was I was, you know, I was interested in Warhol and um, and I was interested in serial procedures and, and that's clear in all of my work that I, I work in series and um, and I, I was I I had the thought that you know like if you look at Warhol's like um, Crash series like no one has ever talked about that and well not that I know of. It, um, like the, there's this idea of like repetition and the, the way repetition has meaning, but I thought it was interesting that no one made that connection to like science and an experimental procedure. The way like uh, in an experiment you set a, a, a set of um, parameters up and then you, um, they kind of play out and if you keep getting the same um, output over and over again, perhaps that becomes like some kind of law or something or, or tells us something about our world. So I thought like this pair was a really funny gray area because it, um, it wasn't in the sort of subjective anything goes realm of art perhaps. Um, I mean that's perhaps like too black and white but it, 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 was, it was neither um, like evaluatable in the realm of the, the unique image but also like it, it wasn't really a law yet. If, if I could keep finding these, then it would become a pattern and a law. So it was in this weird um, um, sort of like Humpty Dumpty zone of um, sort of being 
not one thing or another. Um, so, like, throughout my, I, I mean, I think it's kind of a joke, but it's also true. Like, I, I, philosophy has always been really important to me. I think because I'm a very slow reader, and 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 you can get a lot more like per word, <laughs> um, and also like. I don't know if this is an antiquated way of approaching philosophy, but I've always looked to it for rules about how to be, how the world is, and how I should relate to it. So, um, like, that's how these, that's how I'd like to present these um, quotations. Um, so, in the mind of a Roman or a Greek, neither obedience to the rule nor obedience to court can constitute a beautiful work. A beautiful work is one that conforms to the idea of a certain forma a certain style or a certain form of life. Um, so this was really important to me, and I think there was a, an interesting tie back to Levi-Strauss, because um, Levi-Strauss, after his quote about things going together, he talks about sacred things, and how sacred things um, are things that are, um, like if you remove a sacred thing from its place or its context, it no longer becomes sacred. That um, all of its meaning is, Im is embedded in a kind of, triangulation of experiences. Um, and that to me has become something, that, that's just really important to me. Um, and I think part of my interest in um, information is um, like, I, I saw information as a kind of opposite of what I was doing. Information being something that could be like sort of extracted, exported, and sort of multiplied. But I was interested in forms of life which are embedded in time, in living, um, in flesh, I don't know, yeah. So um, this is a piece that was important to me. Um, it came out of the No End in Sight series. Um, this is called Six Etudes for Four Hands. Um, so in a funny way, like when I was making those small sculptures, um, people kept asking me, like, is there a story, is there a picture, is there a... Like what's the what like moves the work, and I, I just thought that was, in some ways I just thought that was inappropriate, and I didn't want to have to deal with that question anymore. It was really bothering me, um, so I guess I, the way I dealt with it was, um, you know, I, I made these six works, and then um, I remade them it, it, via six videos. So, um, and each one of these videos tells like a mythical story about the creation of a work. So um, this work, this work here, um, I'm going to show you a video, one of the videos from that um, project. How about I throw your hangers? This one. This one. Oh, I just said that. It's like, huh? Just leave it alone. I started and
Sumatra. Um, so via this process, um, like the studio started to become a real character uh, in and of itself. And so I remember throughout this time, I was um, I was taking a lot of photos in the studio of um, they weren't necessarily still lives. Um, they were just things that were happening in the studio um, where I found myself self-struck. You know, I was like surprised um, by what had happened. And in, in, in a way, um, you know, they're kind of traces of activities. Um, they're kind of um, I, I didn't really think of them a, a, as like things that were made, but more like ready-mades. That just happened to come from my own life. And some of them start to have a kind of like um, forensic quality to them, um, which I, I think perhaps related to you know, um, I was really interested in, in um, biography at the time, um, and I was really interested in like historic house museums or like if anybody had gone to Marfa, uh, you know, Judd's house in Marfa. Um, how like, you know, if you go to Marfa, like the, the like the kitchen is kind of set up the way Donald left it, but then like there's like an area there's like maybe there. Are, glasses on a shelf, but that doesn't have meaning, but then maybe like the angle of a bed has meaning. And so like where the gestures of art and where the gestures of life sort of where the border was is really confusing. Um, I, I, I found that really fascinating. Um, I wonder, do I have time? Um, you know, I think we'll, I think we'll, do I have time? Yeah, let me try. I might go 50 minutes. Um, so part of, part of what happened, like, um, so out of, you know, like, throughout my, my practice, I've had moments where, like, writing and, um, writing and, and, and making sort of, like, play, um, play together in, in different ways. So um, as a part of, like, that, that studio project, um, I had a project called In Person, which was all about like the kind of embodied experiences of like being in a house, being a house. Um, I wanted to to use a house as like a conduit for for trying to talk about what it's like to be between an, a body and an object. Um, so I'll just read one of these, and this one's about the bathroom. The same process that erases shower heads with mouths appends pictures with reasons. Looking inward, the arrangement repeats itself, so that on my torso are orifices, are orifices lined up in, in circumference. Drains, vents, windows, a doorway, the way tattoos are strung together on the skin. I pull my head inside my body like a turtle and watch this room spin around like a zoetrope, lit by the incandescent light of organs, the neon swimming of veins and arteries, the fluorescence of bones. Down the street, a dozer cuts asphalt and this whole house trembles. I quiver the floor. I provoke leaves off of rooftops. I bring together and also rend. I pause in an interstice between two sheets of plywall presenting of a flat division its sonorous interior. The vibrations move like waves at times and then like particles triggering simultaneously 
one tile in this bathroom and another above a stove further down the street, as if to arrange them side by side on some greater plane. How far an extension is this dirt on which this house stands? How far is this dirt from being liquid? How far from being atmosphere that waves of pressure are felt from movement, endeavors into the surface so far away? Rumor has it Elvis died on the toilet, mostly, and a little on the floor. I fall into the tub. A giant falls lengthwise across this house and pulverizes it. Dust lifts into the air and is emulsified. Obscure walls rise where walls once were and windows blow out, one after the other like jets from an abalone. The giant fits the dust print like a circle in a square. From above, the dust falling as much as rising makes language on the ground forms and demarcations. Doorways drift down like horseshoes, shackling this enormous and growing, vigorous, living thing to this small plot until it dies or fades and only dust remains. A giant fell here once and on all the houses, radiating outward from here. How long now before the dust settles, the emulsion fades, the suspense becomes unintelligible, and the intimate portrait slackens back to its semi-original form, Again undeveloped, again opaque. Um, so kind of along those lines, um, like I think it's present in this reading that I, I'm thinking about time and I'm thinking about like how things last. What what are the manners in which things last? Um, maybe I should scoot forward. Um, this is a. Um, this is a piece with um, made of eggplant skins um, under um, vacuum-formed cases, um, just screwed to to wooden blocks, um, and they're allowed to kind of decay over over time. Um, I think for me, like this piece, what was very clarifying because it really was about like a path. Like, in terms of like maybe you talk about like a like a Taoist like the Way or like a Nietzschean Zarathustra, but like this idea of like being able to set a path that is disintegrating as you set it, um, and I think that again goes back to like um, sort of like um, things that like lived effects like. Um, things that can't be removed from their their uh, form of life. Um, so, like out of that, I started working with vegetable skins, um, particularly because I found them to be a really interesting ready-made. They were ready-made that that really changed with time. Um, so, this is a T-shirt made of eggplant skins. Um, so, I think my interest in biography um, like I think a, a kind of continuing train of thought in this period was again like what is what is connected what is separate um, and, it, and it has to do with like the activities of life and the activities of art but also like for me these these works were a kind of series of jokes about causality like this implication that things ex that there are these connections um, via these obstructions, um, and that perhaps those connections, those like natural, those natural patterns happen with some kind of meaning. <coughs> um, so the next work that came out of that was called Unknown Games. Um, and I think like. I think I'd always been, um, I'd always been, really been inspired by anthropological objects. Um, and I think that that has a kind of, there's, I guess, a, a danger to it, and there's probably some inappropriateness. Um, and I think it comes out of what I call like a, a strange and unreliable freedom. Like, I, I, I think as someone who, who perhaps had, who came to art again, like, accidentally, I liked anthropological objects because, for me, they opened up a space of ignorance, which just 
got the mind flowing. And I, I wanted to make sculptures which um, created that kind of experience where people, uh, where, you, where you felt like a physical relationship to something. Um, and, and you know it was meant to be interacted with, but like um, t the title Unknown Games suggests that that, that meaning is both present and, and sort of inaccessible. And a lot of these were, um, I, I think part of that connection happens materially via the, a juxtaposition of sort of perhaps artificial ready-mades um, and natural ready-mades. So that's like those gourd, pepper skins, uh, and plastic cups. So this is from a show in Korea at the Ilmen Museum. Um, Yeah, I think, I guess what's there to say, I mean, um, I think my work moves through periods where language seems really appropriate and other periods where language is sort of inappropriate, or for me to talk about, um, like I can talk about the materials, um, that's the, the clear material, the intestine, um, it's like a paper towel up at the top, in the back it's eggplant skin stapled to a board. Um, eggplant skin sort of, um, it kind of acted like a natural sticker on, on a gourd. And these are peppers on dowel rods, kind of pattern, a kind of pattern based, almost like a counting stick. Um, there's a piece from grad school, school called Insults from the Supine Position. Um, you know, like, I, I think I, I've done work performatively at, at various stages in my making. Um, and I remember this one, you know, like, I, I went to Columbia for grad school, and the um, open studios was really like a circus. Like, there would be, like, hundreds of people to come through, and I guess I'll use the word inappropriate again, but I found it to be really inappropriate. I didn't know what to do. Um, and, and I just didn't feel like that's, the open studio was a real site. Like it didn't make sense, it wasn't a, a place of exhibition. Once people came in in those hordes, it was no longer a place of, of work. Um, so uh, what I, the, the way I could deal with it was I, um, I, I, I created like the, the, a performance um, that was uh, like, um, I called it like a podcast called Insults from the Supine Position. That, and like I made up a, a kind of narrative that it was the, the most, it's like the third highly, the third most downloaded world music plus language podcast in Jakarta. Like I wanted, I wanted people to feel like wherever they were wasn't a place. It wasn't the spot. And that like the place was actually some elsewhere point of reception. Um, and so I'll play you like an audio clip from that. supposed to end with me getting up, but now when I get to the end, I don't even try it because I know it doesn't work. <laughs> and also, don't try going back to sleep. What I do, and I consider this a discovery, is I just start all over again. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I do this every day. Um, 
Um, so that's just a, a kind of snippet, but um, there was a, there's a lot more of that. Um, so um, this is uh, some this is a piece from uh, a show I did with Sam Wildman at uh, length by width by height, um, and it was a start of this series um, based on the Sudoku. It's like a Jap it's like a fourth century Japanese poetic format um, that I came across just by accident, but they're roughly translated as exchange poems or dialogue poems. Um, and when I, when I came across it, I thought, oh, like, number one, like the idea of an exchange poem or a dialogue poem, it really, like, I understood it sculpturally right away. I thought, oh, I, I think I can understand that, that that is kind of like totally in relationship to a collage tradition. Um, and it's like syllable based, so it's like five seven seven five seven seven. Um, but I think, like I, I saw it on Wikipedia, you know. Like I think so. There's a, a place where ignorance was really helpful for me, um, and it was like written horizontally. And I think because I'm like a certainly postmodern person, I couldn't see it as like five seven seven is one speaker, and then five seven seven is its its kind of counterpart. I like just immediately intuited a, a position, a, a kind of structure where five seven, the first five seven was one speaker, seven five was, it, was its shadow or its mirror, the second seven was where they spoke together, where they spoke the same language, and the final seven was like objective or scientific voice. And so I used that, that kind of collage structure to create um, conversations or, or points of interaction. So this one, um, it it's a meeting between a person, I read this in this book, Addiction by Design, of a woman who spends her days making slot machines. Um, and then she spends her nights losing all her money to those same slot machines. So she's like a god who creates this enchanted thing and then is enchanted by it. And so like, and she drew out this path of her life which was literally like work, like gas station, casino, work. And it was just like a, a circle. Um, so the, 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 um, the top, the first two lines are, the, are the, the machine speaking. So with one of your hours, come and pay for my minute. Um, and then this, this is the person speaking. If seeing is believing, then I choose belief. Not even solitude here, three-armed casino embrace. And so I use that kind of poetic format um, to, to create, um, not to create, to chaperone these encounters, right? Um, and, um, and as I was doing that, I, I realized, like, I thought it was really interesting that I was using a poetic format. I'm Korean, and I barely speak Korean. Um, so I was using a Japanese poetic format that was, like, translated and distorted a bunch of different times, um, but that distortion was was what was really interesting to me. It, I think it it created a space um, for play. Um, so this piece came out of taking taking one of my poems, feeding it into Google Translate from English to Japanese, and taking that Japanese and feeding it back into Google Translate into English, and doing that until it hit a fixed point. Um, but then for one of these poems, it it didn't hit a fixed point. It, it started to get really, really baroque and started to talk to itself. And um, so this piece um, is a kind of thing that, that's ongoing, but um, it, I think, it, again, it, it's another kind of encounter that happens around the poem, perhaps not necessarily inside of it. Um, so I want, another iteration of that was um, a sound installation um, that uh, I worked on with Fritz Rodriguez. Um, and so here's a, a little clip. Um, some of you may have recognized this from, from um, Winter Wheat. Um, so it's, I think I should kind of speed it up, but um, sort of like as a way of, of, of moving between those, um, you know, like, again, it, it is about these, these collisions. Um, and those, well, maybe we just move on. Um, this is part of a, you know, this, this piece actually, this is a photograph, it's, but it started out as a visualization. Um, I was trying to get money from, I think, one of the granting bodies, local granting bodies here, um, and I hadn't really done my 
um, project called Occupations of Uninhabited Space, where I grow gourds into these steel forecasts. Um, and this was a way of kind of communicating, I thought this was a way of communicating the, an, an idea, um, but it ended up being a piece in and of itself. Um, I think it's, you know, um, in relationship to the gourds, I think it has a bit more, a bit, like the touch is a lot sweeter. Um, so I've been working on this project for the past four years. It, I think it's interesting, like thinking again about like this idea of a form of life. The original intention was to create like a living artwork. I, you know, I, I think I'd like, I'd been driving around, I heard this story on the radio about these like ad hoc genetic modification groups that were like getting together and, and they would like mess with an amoeba and make it smell like bananas or something. I was like, oh my God, I, that's sculpture. I, I think I can do that. Like that's, <laughs> like I can, that's collage. Like I, I understand that. Um, so I was like, um, so I, I want, I had this idea because, you know, gourds only come in like, let's say like 25 um, heirloom varieties. You have like the gooseneck and the dipper and like the cannonball and the martin. Um, and I was like, uh, and I wanted to make my own gourd type. And the idea would be, I, I could kind of like make a shape and then I would, you know, somehow print it into a seed and then, and then you'd come to my exhibition and there would just be seeds. And then again, like, the work would be the form of life. Like it would not be, you couldn't separate the form of life from the, the form of existence. Um, and I, I think that was like many years ago at the time and, and I remember telling a, a friend who was a, a plant geneticist about that and he was like, that's a beautiful idea. He's like, right now what we're doing, this was, I don't know, I know gene editing has, has really improved, but he's like, right now what we're doing is we're literally smashing plant matter into other plant matter. So what you're talking about, you should try to figure out a different way to approach it. Um, so I, I think um, what came out of that was this idea of like, if, if I could start with a, a gourd morphology in mind and then create a forecast, um, like I could create sculptures where, where the, the relationship was actually the form. Um, and, and it was this meeting point where where there's projection and there's distortion and there's chance, um, but um, ultimately, like the the relationship comes out of um, an encounter, or the form comes out of that encounter. And these are two close-ups um, from the series. Um, that's a piece that it started, it's ongoing, and, and it comes by. It's a kind of reverse of the process, because um, I, I I'd say. When I make these, probably two, th maybe half, three fifths of them are something, and the other three fifths are just unrecognizable as a thing. They just, like, I, I remember thinking about it, and you know, it's funny because people have talked to me, like, like, oh, is this work about bondage? Is it, is it like S and M? And um, and I, I think there's some part of that that, like, I, I just can't address. It's not my place. Um, and also, what I think about that that's dead on is that the desire is to relate to these things as a, a living thing. Um, so for me, the, the indicative experience is not sexuality or erotics, but empathy, like recognition. So um, the ones that don't come into existence that I don't recognize as a thing, um, those are the ones that, that, um, that get remade, um, I, I kind of cut them up and remake them into um, things where, where perhaps the exoskeleton, um, the, the skin and the exoskeleton, um, there's a lot more room for those to, to totally flip. Um, it, it's really interesting because this is a piece that originally I thought was a failure and, and um, a friend of mine, a really close friend who'd seen the work a lot, was a painter, she was like, does this go on the wall? And I'm like, oh, whoa. Um, and the reason, I, I think that helped me recognize the piece because um, like what, what I found really interesting about this one is that it's pictorial, you know, like it, it's, a, it's a moment of capture, you know, like um, 
because the, the gourds kind of grow in, and it, this, this captures like a moment in time in a field in Sunnyside, Washington, you know? Um, and, and I think like that like flipping of the plane was really helpful for acknowledging that. This is a uh, much bigger piece. Oh man, I'm going over. Um, um, let me, I'm just gonna zoom through. I just have, so, um, and so I guess we can sort of start to end, but this is a, um, a alternative artist project I, I um, created called Xenia. And um, like, I think out of, okay, like one of the things that I really liked about working with the, in the Gord project is, um, I think I, we all work in, perhaps we, we all understand the arts, but like things happen so quickly. Um, and oftentimes you get opportunities that like you're not really even prepared to take, but you have to because they're really important for you and your growth. Um, and I really liked that the cord, like I, I couldn't speed that process up. It was like tied to a different kind of time that, that like whatever I needed it for couldn't be um, manipulated and, and I liked that and I thought it protected me and it, it kept me from perhaps like perjuring myself so I, it started to me to get to think a lot more about time and, and my relationship to it and Xenia um, you know basically this was a living still life that people could rent for days at a time via Airbnb or directly through me um, I think there, there's definitely some people in this room who stayed at Xenia. Um, some of the really interesting things, um, well, the basic goal was to create the kind of intimate experiences with art that like artists who can tend to be um, not very wealthy and the very wealthy have. But like there's this gigantic middle of people who don't ever get that really transformative experience of spending time with art the way you want it, how you want it, ignoring art, coming back to it, you know, this kind of um, having a relationship with it where like you're not you're not judging it, meeting it, um, and trying to experience it all at the same 10 seconds. Um, and I think it had to do with trust and it had to do with vulnerability. Um, and again, like this idea of a, of a living thing, like art is a living thing. Um, like, I think part of, like, part of the experience of a living thing is its vulnerability and, and a sense of trust. So. Um, I think that was a really important part of this project that you kind of that people were entrusted with a space and asked to take care of it. Oh, and, and in a kind of interesting way, this platform became um, like a. Everybody moved it around in their own separate way to, to make use of it, and so it became a kind of its own still life. And then, I think we can end there. There definitely was to those, to those eggplant. Oh, or why are you curious about that? <laughs> well, I, I thought the question came to mind when you mentioned the peppers around the ah. um, stick, and I thought, oh, I wonder did the that, did the plant use any kind of smell, or did you use soft smell? I'm sure the process has smell, but yeah, that's really interesting. Because like in that same show, I had a, I had a jug of cheese balls and then, with also concrete, and so like the piece was about the the moment. I don't know if it's about, but what I loved about that piece was the moment where the concrete balls on top and the cheese balls on bottom met, and like the oil started to like move up through the concrete. Um, but, I, you know, the, the smell wasn't an important part for me. Um, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because I work with a lot with food. Uh, it's, yeah. Maybe I'll think about that. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, do a lot of your pieces, um, do they come to a natural stopping point on their own? Uh, is there some of the things like the one minute, or, or not one minute, like the other palm size sculptures, like things like that, was a pro there was a process. How, is there a way that you, it feels to you like this is, you know, this, this is the, you know, this is finished. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really, yeah. I think it's a really good question because it's a question that I have multiple non-answers for, like in the work. <laughs> you know, like, I, and I think my interest in biography relates to that because, like, I think, you know, like, like if you read theories of biography, there's questions about whether or not you can write a biography until someone dies. Um, and how like that moment is doesn't necessarily have to be meaningful, but it is an endpoint. It, it um, and so like, in some ways like, um, beginning and endpoints. I think I relate to beginning and ends in my work the way I relate to beginning and ends in life. They're they're an embedded part of a, a process which. Um, like, where the rules are shifted by the process itself. So, um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's the eternal question. Yes? Um, you were talking about, I forget how you put it, but particularly in the beginning, that you're interested in this sort of basic idea of how forms acting on each other to kind of create something new and it's that process and I think you use the word like encounter that forms this and I hearing you say that like I've seen your work a lot but I'm like oh like I see that all the time now like that was an interesting way of like it's insightful um is there a point in your like life or your art making when you realize that was something you were interested in and do you have a sense of why that's interesting to you it seems like a very like fundamental interesting sort of like philosophical Um, well, I have a story. Awesome. Um, so, like, it's kind of a story about how I sort of became an artist. Um, like, I remember, you know, like, as an undergrad, I went to school and I was supposed to be a lawyer and I was take, and, but I was going to be like, maybe like a, I was going to be like a writer, I was going to be like a lawyer who also writes, so I was taking English literature classes, and then my grandfather died. My grandfather was the one who was really like, who was really setting the parameters. Um, so then, and also simultaneously, like, I needed a work-study job, um, and I had two choices. The first was to drive the Zamboni in the ice skating rink, <laughs> and I got an interview for that, and I showed up, and like, there was like a hockey coach and then two big hockey players and like the moment I walked in I was like oh this isn't a job this is like a facade this is a farce for like for like uh, for people who play sports to get work study money so I instantly knew like I, I, I'm not gonna get that and my second um, <laughs> my second choice was to um, was to work in the wood shop as a wood shop metal shop monitor and, and the person who, who ran it um, taught me how to use the tools and and actually it's a kind of really embarrassing, there's going to be an embarrassing through line, but I was in love with this girl, and I made her a bookshelf, and one of the teachers said, like, if you like making things, you just take a sculpture class. And I took this sculpture class, and then, you know, like, um, it was Daphne Fitzpatrick's sculpture class, and then um, I ended up taking Jessica Stockholder's sculpture class, and she was like, you're always here, just come be a part of the critiques, the graduate critiques, they happen every Wednesday. And so, like, I was a suburban kid from Long Island, and, like, I would go, and we'd come into a room and it'd be Wednesday night and people, there'd be something on the floor and, and people would come in, it'd be two hours and people would argue. It, it would get so intense and personal about like 
like like the color of a of a, a dripping thing, and it was really unclear what the rules were. But it was just like I, I just want to be around. I've never been so like fired up. Um, so I was like, oh, I want to do this. And my dad, my dad, I remember telling my dad, I, like I did like this this summer school at SVA, and he was teaching at Chelsea Pierce at the time, and we had this summit. At, like in New York, and we had food. Then he came back, and I was take, uh, taking this summer school at SVA. So we came back to the dorm because we had talked so long, and um, and then at some point he was like, "Okay, you know what? You do, you know, like you live your life, you make your decisions. If you want to do art, that's fine. And 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 you're gay." And I, <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> I, and then, but you know, it was an interesting thing because like, like I kind of, like, I think my dad would have been an artist if, if his early life had been different. But, so like, I had been trying to figure out whether or not, like, art was going to be viable, whether or not I could keep doing this thing that I was really enjoying. It was like sophomore year, end of sophomore year, and it was like the summer in New Haven, and like, it was like beautiful, and my best friend who I was in love with, we, we like got these like, prosciutto, mozzarella, sun-dried tomato, basil with like balsamic, these sandwiches. We took them <laughs> on these bikes. We rode up to East Rock. Um, we had lunch. We fell asleep on each other. We woke up. They were like ants eating the sandwich. It was just like, it, like there's like so many sensations. Um, and then we start, we, we're done and we're riding our bikes back and we're going down the hill and it was kind of like, it felt like a Truffaut film because there was like light like shooting through the trees and she's up front and and she's on her bike in front, and she does like the, the no hands thing. And I was never good at the no hands thing. But I'm like, you know, like this, you gotta get into the, get into the groove. So I, I kind of got into it, and, and I'm kind of like, I'm in it, and I'm experiencing it, and I'm like totally doing it. And then like, I start to recognize that I'm doing it. And, and I see her kind of like, she, I see her kind of like swerve off to the, the right, and, and, I'm, and I'm still here, and I start drifting to the left, and then we get to a turn, and this car comes around the turn, and, and it just like comes around. And so I, I grab on the brakes, I slip down, and I go right underneath the car, and, the, and like the bumper comes like literally like this close to my face. And so I, like, I, like the, per, the, the driver of the car, she gets out, um, and, and I'm trying to like pull myself out from under the car. Um, and she's, the first thing she says to me, is like, oh my God, oh my God, um, are you okay? And yeah. And then she said, oh my God, oh my God, you don't know what it means to not have a job. So I was like, <laughs> I, like I had no idea what's going. So I take the bike, I take the, the the rest of the bike, and I sit over to the side of the road, and like like there's like this area starting to like get sticky and hot. I'm sitting down. Um, and then this like junky Econo van starts to like, like bound down the hill, and then it comes, it comes, and as they go around the turn, they yell out "faggot," and they, th and I kind of get up to like give them the fingers. I'm like, I had enough today, so I get up, <laughs> and then like, like a set of firecrackers explode at my feet, and and I was like. <laughs> I was like, that is not a, like, that is not a story. Like, like, none of that made sense. But, like, that's the procedure of life. Like, there is no, there is no reason for that to, like, occur. But, like, it, it, like, that is the chain of events. So, I thought, like, like, there is no narrative for it. So, I might as well, like, proceed Proceed as if there isn't a narrative. Proceed as if there isn't like some some path or some guiding principle or some rule system, um, and just like experience it as it comes. So, um, I think that either that or or my attachment to that experience is, I think, part of this relationship to encounter about um, you know when does a life become a narrative? When does like when does like a life become a biography? Like though. Like the, this idea of like lived form, um, 
I, I think encounter is a way of trying to touch the live form or, or have it be you um, as opposed to like 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 a, an extract um, yeah um, let me read it. yeah yeah <laughs> Um, so it's, um, man, it's kind of corny, but a little bit of it, like, uh, why am I going to, I'm going to give advice, but I was like, I, I think it's really amazing when you reach out, like, who responds, um, because I, I had read this book called Mortality, Immortality, um, and it was about, like, whether or not contemporary art is meant to survive, and in it, I read about Christian Scheidemann, who's the kind of leading, leading conservative, conservator of um, sort of contemporary materials. Um, and he, he was the one who, who was brought in to, to, um, to conserve Zoe Leonard's piece, Strange Fruit, which is made of orange skins. But he also worked on Matthew Barney's potatoes. And, um, and I had read about his process. And um, what he did was he ta- he, you take a thing, take it down to like absolute zero, wherever, as close as you can, pull out all the water, and then pump in like a cellulose, like a kind of photograde cellulose. And so like I was experimenting with my own like cheapo version of that. So I would take like silica gel, pull all the water out, and then put 100% vegetable glycerin in, and then like pat it down and then pump it back in. Um, and, and so I reached out to him. I told him like, this is what I'm doing. Um, I, I like, like, even though like I'm an artist, you're a conservator, I feel as if we're in the same field. Um, and he was really cool. He, he kind of, like, he had me bring my stuff over, and um, and we kind of got to talk about like the processes. Um, but that shirt is still totally stable, um, and like gourds, you know, I think people are always like, like worried that gourds are going to rot. But gourds, in the same way, like, they're basically like wood. You know, as long as you, as long as you keep them, like, with. As long as you treat them the way you would treat wood, they'll 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 last. And and I like I wasn't interested in a kind of like like for me with that shirt with like the vegetable skin pieces. There's a moment after which the piece is broken, like a, a moment a, a level of degradation after which the piece is no longer acceptable. Um, so it's not like a kind of Andy Goldsworthy style interest in like um, decay. It, it really is a, a, an interest in um, like almost like, you know, like natural mummies, like a, a kind of moment of an in-between freezing between like a kind of decaying and, and, and living. But yeah. Any other, any other questions? It's a good question. Thank, thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, thanks for listening and